excited to have everyone um, on the call today. I'm going to go ahead and move over to the presentation. And um, before I start, I guess I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts. Um, one of which is this is a challenging time for everyone with COVID-19. And, you know, I first off, I just hope everyone is staying safe, um, that you're you know, able to get through each and every day without too many challenges. Um, and that uh, you know, you're staying positive. I think that's really important to do during this time. The other thing I wanted to say is, you know, that it's so important um, at this time as brands or brand owners that we think about how we communicate as a brand and to be sensitive to the world in this kind of new um, situation we're in. Uh, and we're going to be in for a while and we're going to be recovering from for a long time. So, you know, it's really important to pay attention to what you're saying and how you're listening and being sensitive to everyone. So one of the things that I wanted to do to kind of get us started was just to do a little poll. And I'm gonna see if I can make this work. You should see a poll in front of you. I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. And I've asked the question, Will brands matter even more during and after COVID-19? So I'd love to hear your responses to this, um, you know, whether it's yes, whether it's no, you think it's gonna be the same. Um, I'm gonna let a few more folks in while we're doing that. So, so far we have a dominant of yes, not everyone's participated yet, but six out of seven say brands will matter even more during COVID-19. And no one said no and one said the same. And now we have seven of eight. And I think that's right. And I'll just give it a couple more seconds. Eight of nine, nine of, nine of 10. <laughs> So, um, well, that's good. I think we'll go ahead and stop now and I'll, sh I'll end the poll, but I, I agree. I agree 100% that, um, that I think brands are gonna matter more. And um, so I'll, you can see the results that showed 10, I guess nine people went ahead and um, voted and, and, and eight of nine said that, um, that they would um, would would matter, and I and I agree with that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so let me go ahead and cancel that and go ahead and get started in the presentation, and um, and let's think about brand expansion and optimization today in light of COVID nineteen because I think it's going to be important to do that. So just a second. All right, we're going to go ahead and jump in. The first thing I want to share is that. Each brand has its own universe. And what I mean by that is if you think about a brand and how you relate to that brand, you might connect with it in one space or you might connect with it in dozens of spaces. You know, think about brands you love and, and how they affect your life and how much you are involved um, with them and how they're involved with you. You know, for me, it's brands like um, Coca-Cola and, and, my, and my Acura and um, Siri and, and my Apple, these brands take up a lot of my life and they take it up in, in a very interesting different ways. And part of that is um, by, um, by filling my life in ways that uh, are connected to me more, not just in the way that the product serves my needs, but also in the way that um, the product reflects who I am as a person. So some brands are fuller than other in our lives and some are less. And so because of that, you know, we need to think about um, how we can react, re relate to brands and, um, and then basically verses are more complete than others. And if we move on to the next screen, we'll see that expansion can fill in the gaps. And so think about it that way. Think about your brand, how it relates to others, how important it is to others, and then how you can fill the gaps that um, allow you to connect with your, with your fans, right? 
And those gaps might be in the sense that you're connecting with them via social media, you're listening and having a conversation with them, you're connecting with them at some point, hopefully in the future through experiential. And experiential, of course, typically means uh, in a place geographically, but it can be experiential digitally as well. And also it's, it's via the product itself and it's via the messaging. So think about that and think about how expansion can help you in that regard. And what we can, we can learn is that some universes are better than others. And what I mean by this is if we think about the entertainment industry, they have universes that are much fuller than many of the consumer product universes. So, so if you think about um, like the Star Wars universe and, and the way that that brand engages with you, right? You, you can see it via uh, feature film, you can see it via video games, you can uh, engage with it via social media, you can engage with it via the internet, you can engage with it through commercial products, you can engage with it via gaming. And so there's many, many things that the entertainment industry can teach us as brand owners that we can start to apply to our own brands. Now, of course, do the litmus test and say, you know, to yourself, does it make sense for me to add this to my brand? But, but the method, the mechan mechanisms that are being used today uh, by other industries, by other universes is really important to look at and say, oh, wow, look what they're doing here. Maybe I can include that in the way that I'm communicating with my, my audience, my fans. So let me introduce the lasso framework and the methodology. This is a framework that I co-developed with a gentleman named Mark DeSoma. Mark DeSoma is a brand strategist out of uh, New Zealand and <clears throat> terrifically talented gentleman. And so the two of us got together and said, can we come up with a methodology that would help brand, <clears throat> excuse me, brand owners think about their brands and whether or not their brands are under optimized, optimally expanded or over expanded. So the first part of that is called lateral. <clears throat> So when we think about lateral, um, this is about how brands move from their core category into different other categories that are appropriate for the brand. So in the case of Bulgari, which is a jewelry brand, right? It's a brand that um, is known for um, accessories and jewelry and high, high end. Well, they wanted to en enhance their experience for their fans, for those that love the brand. And so what they decided to do was expand into resorts, exclusive resorts selected across the globe. And I actually became um, connected to this particular brand when I was on my honeymoon 11 years ago now in Bali, Indonesia. So they had a Bulgari resort in Bali, which we just bumped into my wife Emily and I, and um, it was amazing. It was such a cool uh, experiential aspect of the brand, and they felt it was so important for them to enter into the resort category because it really enabled them to tell furthermore, uh, communicate with their target audience, which is women, in a more, um, uh, I would call it a more exclusive way, in a more, in a, in a more uh, selective way. So here's another um, brand that, that expanded laterally, and this is the Pantone brand, right? So we use the Pantone brand to tell us exactly what color we are using when we think about our, um, our marketing material, right? But also Pantone ended up uh, extending into mugs and tabletop products and books, and they took advantage of this equity that they had, which so many of us have heard about, and they said, we can, we can adopt and we can expand and we can connect with our, with our fans, with our consumers in a way that allows us to build our universe and enhance our universe beyond just our core product, which is the Pantone colors. And one more example is Better Homes and Gardens, which they um, developed a whole extensive category of uh, products in Walmart so that those who had known the Better Homes and Gardens brand could also connect with it via um, consumer products. I need to let one more person in, so I'll do that right now. And hopefully the screen will go away and it won't. So I'm gonna have to jump out for a second. I'll jump right back in, sorry about that. 
just bear with me as we do this. Okay, so that's a little bit of example of what I'm talking about when I speak about lateral expansion. Let's talk now a little bit about addictive. That's the second element of the lasso model. So we have lateral, addictive, storied, scalable, and ownable. And so when we think about addictive as a category for brain expansion evaluation, no, there's no better example than the Pokemon Go uh, phenomenon that happened in 2016. You know, this showed more than anything how people could get addicted to a brand that they were already familiar with, they already loved. Millions of people before 2016 played the game Pokemon, but when they developed this Pokemon Go application so that people could connect with it digitally and play, uh, you know, basically a game with it, within one year, there was 500 million downloads which is a crazy number to even contemplate how many people, but that's more than, um, you know, that's approximately 50 million a month that downloaded. And since 2016, another 500 million people have downloaded the game. So the craze that happened in 2016 with Pokemon Go didn't just fade, it's still going on strong. And while they didn't grow 500 million in the next three years, they did grow 500 million over the next you know, three years, and now we're into 2020, and we'll see how much further it goes. In addition to that, from a revenue perspective, they generated $3 billion in revenue, which is a phenomenal amount for any one particular game. And today, 147 million active users of the game. So why did um, Pokemon Go, why was it so um, addictive? Well, you know, there's, there's several reasons, but each point of contact with the brand for, for this particular example, and for any brand that is addictive, it's surprising and it's delightful in its own right. And consumers, when they interact with the brand, they, the relationship is actually strengthened and loyalty grows and interest in it seeking, seeking out further enhances. So I play this little game on my phone called Ruzzle. It's kind of like a Scrabble. And it's a one minute competition where I am competing with 20 people, 19 other people, and I'm trying to figure out how many words I can connect with and make within a, a one minute period. And then because certain letters have triple word score or double word score or you know triple letter score, I'm scoring points. And I love it because I feel like it makes my mind sharper and it's the competition is fun. And that's what addictive brands do. They keep coming, bringing you back because every experience is new and refreshing, but it's still consistent for you so that you're not too surprised when you, when you see it. And so that's important when we think about your brand. Is it addictive? Does it make people want to have more of it all of the time? The next category is story. Story is so important. So I want to give an example with the, uh, the movie Rogue One. Rogue One was a movie that was created in 2016 by um, Lucasfilm, which was now part of the Disney uh, company. So Lucasfilm was bought, I, I want to say in 2012. And so what Disney wanted to do with Rogue One was connect all of the prequel series that had happened with the sequel series. So we start out with the prequel, then, sorry, we start out with the sequel, the three series in the sequel, then we got the prequel. So how did all this happen? And what Rogue One did was connect the three together. Now you can imagine how many fans the Star Wars platform had had up to that point, right? With the sequel, then the prequel. And who better than Disney to say, look, we are going to connect the two together and make the story so strong that even though it was made you know, decades after the first movie was made, you're gonna watch and think, oh, this story really happened. Like the details of the story and how they introduced Darth Vader at the end, as if, the, as if it were all part of something that was real. And it was really what happened was Disney was so good at getting the story right that they connected the dots and enhanced the viewing experience for their fans. And that's why story is so important because we relate to it and we all from, you know, back in caveman days, story was so important. So the story for you and for your brand is equally important as you think about 
building brand loyalty and also being able to brand, expand your brand into new categories. So, you know, just a couple of things. Every human being has an understanding of narrative. We talked a little bit about that. Brands are able to take what's customary and take them on a journey that both, both seems familiar, but also is new. And stories are, um, they're personal in nature, right? They draw us in and they, and they lean on things that we know in our history. For example, with the Coca-Cola brand, you know, what they rely on is maybe you're gonna remember an experience you had when your parent maybe took you for your first Coke and what that experience was like. And, and, and or it's warm memories around a, a, a Thanksgiving day table where Coca-Cola was served or when somebody special came to the house and, and your mom or your dad brought out Coca-Cola as a way to welcome them in. And we all have examples of, of those kind of personal connections with brands. And of course I use Coke because it's such a great brand. It's one of the brands that I, um, that I love so much. So, you know, if you can build a brand that has, you know, this story per, part to it and add, continue to add to the story, you're going to create that bond that makes it so special for you. And, and that's what all the great brands do today. The next part of the model is called scalable. And so this is, think about scalable as how you reach new audiences. And that could be new audiences that are unique to your brand's um, service offering or product offering, or it could be new audience that are geographically beyond where your brand is today. So I wanna give an example of that. Uh, again, I'm using another uh, Coke example, but here's one that I thought was so compelling and it's Coca-Cola shoes. Now, most of us, when we think about Coca-Cola, we're not thinking about shoes or in this case, tennis shoes. We're thinking about first, maybe the beverage and all the categories of beverages, but then maybe second thinking about Coca-Cola pins because they have such a connection with pins uh, around the Olympic games and other pins that they create and then merchandise, right? You probably own a Coke t-shirt or you may own a Coke hat and maybe some uh, casual Coke, you know, like flip-flops, but Coke basketball shoes or Coke shoes uh, in general. Well, in Brazil, they built the brand of the Coca-Cola shoes so strong. It's number two in the category only behind Nike. So it's ahead of Adidas and it's ahead of, um, Converse and every other brand of shoes. In fact, they've sold 100 million, more than $100 million of Coca-Cola shoes in, um, in the country of Brazil. And the country of Brazil now makes up more than 30% of the royalty revenue that Coca-Cola generates. And a lot of that is because of shoes. And so when I talk about scalability, when you have a brand as universal, as global as the Coca-Cola brand, you're able to tap into things that are important to your fans and, and scale, the, scale the opportunity beyond um, you know, your, your, your borders, uh, whatever that new category is. So depending on what your footprint is today, that will dictate where you can go with your brand expansion. And of course, digitally today, we're able to do that with um, what we're doing um, on our call where we can connect via Zoom with people all over the world. So when we think about scalability, we want to consider the following, which parts to make even bigger and which to ad adapt or omit, resolving what I'll call the expansion riddle. And that riddle says, expanding the brand into sectors that fit with the brand, but are also growing at rates that will add critical momentum. So when we think about today with COVID-19 and everything that's going on that makes this world more challenging, especially hard hit are the entertainment industry, the restaurants, everything where people are required to, to gather together. And that's really, really difficult and tragic for those categories. So um, when you think about your own brand, especially in light of, of COVID-19, you might say, you know, I'm gonna avoid any categories that require me to uh, bring the brand and connect the brand in a, um, in a, in a in a group setting, right? Because we know that that type of category for the, for the foreseeable future is going to be one that's probably stymied um, and will not be growing. So even though your brand might be perfect to expand into it, 
the, um, the momentum will actually be negative instead of positive. The other thing we want to look at is that you're not looking to enter into a new market just through licensing, but you're looking to link the brand to the growth levels that are in that market as well. So the idea is you bring your brand into a, into a marketplace where it has strength, where it couples with a category that um, consumers want, and your brand coupled with that category, one and one equals three and four and even five. And so I've kind of talked about this already, the idea of stall growth and scalability. So, you know, just keep that in mind as you think about where you want to take your brand in the future. The last of the five elements of measuring the Lasso brand are what I call ownable. And so when we think about ownable, this is what the brand actually owns, but, but it's beyond the legal definition of what ownable means. In other words, it's more than just the trademark, it's more than just the patent, it's more than the trade secret, but it's what the organization and the totality of the consumers and the fans think they own. So let's take the example with New Coke. Um, New Coke was launched in 1985. The reason it was launched was because earlier in the 1980s, Pepsi did what they called the Pepsi Challenge. And in the Pepsi Challenge, they had people do a, uh, a blindfolded taste test and they had some coca-cola and they had some pepsi and in that pepsi challenge more consumers chose pepsi than coke so P coke got nervous about that right because they thought it was all about taste and they were worried that we're going to lose more and more share to pepsi and so they said okay we have to come out with a new formula and we'll call it they didn't call it New Coke at the time, they just called it Coke and they launched it. And they were thinking this is going to really jumpstart their sales because they had been waning. And what happened? There was public outcry. Many of us who know the brand Coca-Cola remember that period where consumers just lashed out at the Coca-Cola company and said, give me back my Coke in its original formula. Stop messing around with my Coke. They didn't say their Coke, they said my Coke because they believed they owned it. And frankly, at that point, if, if Coca-Cola didn't listen, they were gonna lose the brand as they knew it that day. So within six months, they had figured out a way to bring the old Coca-Cola back, they called it Coca-Cola Classic, and they kept the new formulation and they called it New Coke because they said, okay, we will satisfy the needs of the consumers who want the traditional Coca-Cola, which is the vast majority, and we'll tap into those consumers who like the sweeter flavor of Pepsi and maybe steal some share there. The important thing to remember in this whole thing about Ownable was that for, for consumers, and this is us with every brand, right? It's more than just the product, it's, it's um, I would call it its physical attributes. It's the emotional attributes that a brand creates that draw us to it. In fact, there's the emotional attributes are the reasons why many of us buy a product. And, and the way that the product itself helps define who we are as an individual. So without the regular Coca-Cola, the one that people had grown up to love, all of that got just completely blown up. And so we're very quickly, Coke was smart enough to realize that they had made a big mistake. And after that happened, their sales increased at a dramatically positive rate. So this was a very good thing for Coke, but it could have been very devastating. And so I, they said back then, and I'll say it now, never let a crisis go to waste, right? They had a crisis, they figured out how to do the right thing, they solved it, and, and they were better off for it. And we're in a crisis right now. So think about your brand, think about your constituents, your fans, your consumers. How can you let this crisis actually make you stronger and better ready to uh, engage with them in the future? So, you know, when I talk about the brand um, uh, and its own ability, it's a specific trademark. Yes, a uh, company owns that trademark, but in addition, they, they, they own those other aspects, as I mentioned, but the own ability, the ownership also often lies with consumers. And in the case of some franchises like McDonald's or um, any of those quick service restaurants, many of those franchisees, they feel they own the brand just as much as the brand owner itself, the, 
the franchisor. And arguably, if the franchisor doesn't listen to those franchisees, they're going to be in a very, very difficult position because in many of these instances, the franchisors are number many, many more times than the franchisee. Sorry, the franchisees number many, more, many more times than the franchisor. So they have the power of their collective voices to sway the, the success or the failure of the brand. So it's important to say when you're thinking about a brand, who owns it, but think of that ownership in the big sense of the universe and not just in the legal sense, which is what maybe your lawyers might drive you to say or think. So now that we've covered the model and we talked a little bit about the brand universes, what I want to introduce to you, which is this critical element that enables you to determine where your brand should expand. And I call it the brand expansion point. And the brand expansion point is that common reference point for every place that the brand moves into. It's the singular idea that relates consumers to the brand. So if you think about your brand, does it connect emotionally with, it, with your consumer base or does it connect physically? So emotionally, I've talked about the Coca-Cola brand, um, but another brand that's very emotionally connected is like, for example, the Harley Davidson brand. Now, let me just talk about the Harley Davidson brand for a second, right? That brand is a brand of motorcycle, right? But why is that brand <clears throat> different than, for example, the Suzuki brand? Well, the Harley Davidson brand in many, many people's minds stands for freedom and uh, rebellion and, you know, the uh, ultimate idea of Americana. What does Suzuki stand for? Well, a high performing motorcycle. Let's not confuse the two, right? Because Harley Davidson stands for all those things that I just mentioned, they can go to many, many categories um, that allow the consumer, the fan um, to engage with the brand, many of which may never even own the Harley Davidson, Harley Davidson motorcycle, but they have no problem with wearing the, the, uh, the jacket or um, buying their kids play toys. Um, so it's, it's a brand that connects in a way emotionally, and that's the important thing to remember. But for a brand that connects physically, that is a different situation, and the limitations of that are important to know. So here, let me, let me show you um, a picture of a ride on a uh, roller coaster in Abu Dhabi. And this roller coaster is taken out of what they're calling Ferrari World. And think about the Ferrari brand, right? It means speed, it means acceleration, it means the, you know, the vibrancy of being in something that has the performance characteristics unlike any other automobile, right? And when you think about the Ferrari brand, how many people can actually afford to own a Ferrari brand? I mean, we're talking about probably 0.1% of the population, right? But if you're a fan of the brand, what better way to consume the brand and experience the brand than to go to Ferrari World where there's rides and there's all kinds of thematic ways to, um, to be in, enthralled inside the brand. And so for many of these fans who will never drive a Ferrari or, or and even less who will own a Ferrari, they can experience the thrill of, of the speed and acceleration through this Ferrari world. And Ferrari understood that and so they've developed um, this connection with the entertainment and theme park industry. So now they've expanded into theme parks. Now, hopefully COVID-19 will end in the not too distant future and more and more people will be able to experience the Ferrari brand through the theme park, but know that this is why they did it. And it was um, very compelling for them. But if you were a, a, um, a form of a vehicle, let's say maybe Toyota, could you, could you have done this? No, because Toyota doesn't really stand for speed and acceleration and power like the Ferrari brand does. And so there's an emotional connection for which the Ferrari brand can connect with its audience. So we talked about the lasso model. We talked about the brand expansion point. We talked about connecting um, via emotions. 
We gave an example of connecting physically with Suzuki. Let me give one more example of connecting physically. This is with a brand I absolutely love, but it's a physical connection. And that's the M&M brand. I love peanut M&Ms. They're my favorite bar none. And um, when I can't get them, another form of the, uh, the M&M brand that I also love is um, almond, chocolate covered almonds. So almond M&Ms. But I'm not really a big fan of, of the traditional chocolate M&Ms. The, they, they're not my, one of my favorites. But what we know about M&Ms is they can pretty much cover anything in their chocolate candy covered, co colored outside and be, um, be in a position where they can, um, sorry, I'm just gonna stop for a second and let one more person in. Bear with me. Okay, let me go back to sharing the screen. And so when I talk about the consumer is the boss, and in the case of M&Ms, they really can't connect on an emotion. I'm sure some people feel an emotion of maybe happiness or joy at eating their M&Ms, but it doesn't correlate like the brands that I just talked about. It doesn't correlate like the Coca-Cola brand or the um, Fer Ferrari brand or the Harley Davidson brand or think of another brand that you know, like Virgin, for example, that connects emotionally. These brands that connect physically, they just need to know that. And if they don't know it, the consumer who is the customer will absolutely let them know when they try to do something crazy and it's unsuccessful. And I'll give you one example of that. We'll, we can talk maybe on the next webinar about some, what I call like classic, uh, catastrophic failures in brand expansion. But one of them, for example, was when Colgate came out with frozen dinners a few years back. And think about that for a second, right? Colgate is a leader in oral high care, um, hygiene, right? Oral care, right? Toothpaste, toothbrushes, floss, maybe even whitening. It's all around the oral aspects of our mouths. Somebody in the, Co the Colgate um, organization came up with the big idea that they could create frozen dinners because people put Colgate in their mouth. The craziest thing about this is if you think about it is not just one person came up with it because one person had to tell, convince another person which then convinced another one and it had to go through the whole hierarchy they had to actually create the product and they had to bring the product to market and then when they did the consumer said what are you trying to do Colgate? stay in your lane and their lane is a physical lane right it's all around oral um, hygiene and, and oral care and so that was a colossal failure so you can do it ahead of time by knowing your brand knowing um, your fans knowing your consumers listening to them engaging with them you know through social media through research or you can do it the hard way which is actually create the product and then find out that that consumers aren't going to be interested in it so Remember that and that will hold you in good stead. So we're almost, we're getting to the point where we're, we're kind of finishing um, the formal aspect of this uh, presentation and then I'm looking forward to answering your questions. But that, I've just talked about, you know, the model. Now let's talk about the four methods of brand expansion, right? So this is a very kind of cumbersome detailed um, flow chart, but let me just break it down into, some, into each of its pieces. So the first one, the first question you should ask yourself is, does the company have the competency to market design and produce the product with internal resources? If the answer is no, we don't have the competency to market design and produce with internal resources, then ask yourself the question, does the company have the competency to design and produce the product? If the answer is yes, then, we will go to the next step, which is, hold on, bear with me just a second. If you have the, op the ability to, um, to market the product, and if you can design and produce it, and you have the resources, and you have the relationships with the distributors and the retail channels, and you have presence in the markets, in the geographic regions that you want to expand, then you go with option one. And that option is basically to go ahead and source the product. 
And so when you're sourcing it, you're in a position to, I mean, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my computer. Let's see if I can get this solved. So option one, sourcing is the ability to, is, is what you do if you have the ability to market. Now let's look at option two, which is when you want to in, produce the product internally. What we're saying there is that you have the competency to market, you have the ability to produce the product, and you have the ability to distribute the product and sell the product. In which case, then you go with option two. So you go ahead and produce the product and sell it internally. So we've covered option one, which is sourcing, option two, which is producing it internally. Then we look at, well, what if the company doesn't have the competency to produce the product? Then you're looking at two other options. I'll call them three and four for the sake of uh, this uh, demonstration. So the option three could be, okay, we know that this is the right category for our brand. We're not able to produce it design it, market it. So we'll go ahead and buy another company and that company will go ahead and do that. So we'll acquire a company and that acquisition will enable us to achieve everything we need to achieve and expand our brand into the category that the brand needs to be in to build out our universe and connect with our consumers in the way they wanna be connected. If um, if you don't wanna go that route and, and, and there's many reasons why you wouldn't because that route oftentimes is fraught with a lot of challenge, right? Because when you acquire a company, the integration of that company can be very detrimental to the success of, the co of that particular acquisition long-term. So that's when you can consider um, another option, which is much more um, freeing, which is this option of, of, of licensing. And so when you license, then you have the ability to drive your brand message but go to a company who's not going to be owned by you, but they are going to effectively rent your brand and they're gonna rent it and you're gonna drive the direction of the brand, you're gonna drive the visual standards of the brand, the messaging of the brand, and their job is to absorb and build into their product or service all aspects of that. And so that's when you're in a position where licensing can be really a powerful tool for you. So, We've covered off on um, the whole method of, of thinking about brands and especially thinking about brands during COVID-19. We talked about brand universes. We talked about the lasso model, the lateral, the addictive, the story, the scalable and the ownable. We talked about the brand expansion point and we talked about the four methods of expansion. So what I wanted to share with you is there's actually a tool that, we, that I developed, co-developed uh, the model with Mark DeSoma, but then created this algorithm, which is which allows us to do a lasso model assessment. And that algorithm, um, I can jump to it now or jump to it in a few minutes, but uh, Savannah will share it with you. If you just go to pkenelicchio.com forward slash lasso, you can go in and, and answer five simple questions about your brand against the lateral, addictive, storied, scalable, and ownable uh, different areas, and it will tell you whether or not your brand is underexpanded, optimally expanded, or overexpanded. So we're kind of at the point where we can do Q and A. So I want to open up um, for questions, and let's just see if there's anything specific that you have that we can talk about, so that I can actually um, address those specific questions. And if you haven't signed up for our newsletter and you want to, you can just text my name, Pete, to 345345. I have over 5,000 unique images that are available for licensing. How would I go about securing my first licensing deal since there isn't a conference or trade show to go to at the moment? Okay, um, great question. So the first thing you need to understand is, um, is how licensable those images are. And so there's one of the things that I've done is actually enable you to look at your, at your product or your brand and be able to determine whether or not that brand is licensable, right? But let's make the assumption that it is licensable. 
then what you need to do is define um, what those categories are. And then once you've defined those categories, then you have to look at who are the potential um, companies that are making products in those categories that would want your images. And there is um, a whole uh, thing that I go through in one of my guidebooks. It's actually called, um, uh, basically it, it's, it's designed or the book is, is about, you know, building your brand licensing um, dynasty effectively. And in there, I talk about, you know, how do you find those licensees? And so in today's world where you can't go um, visit them at a conference, what you can do is do research online, right? You can look and, and you can do research around the different categories that you're wanting to license. And then you can see, okay, who are the companies in those categories? Now, before you reach out to those companies, you need to make a compelling argument for why they might want to license your images, right? So you want effectively a sales deck because you're going to be selling the idea that your images are an important way for these companies to grow their business. And so you'll start that dialogue with them about the value of your images and then engage with them, right? And, and, and I always want to have at least three choices, right? Because there is always the, the potential that the, um, the company that you're engaging with who should want your images or want your brand, um, it's just not a good time for them. So you wanna have at least two or three others so that you can then find the one who says, yep, that brand makes sense for my product or service. And I'm in a position now where I know that this particular brand or the, in this case, this particular image will add value immediately to my organization. And I'm willing to put the investment in to incorporate those images so that the combination of those reaches my consumers today in a way that's compelling. It touches on all those different aspects of the lasso model, or it actually allows me to reach new um, fans, new consumers, which then enhances my overall um, opportunity. And certainly, you know, I know so we can go through this one-on-one -on -one in more detail, um, but that's, that's what I would share with you on that. AK, you say you mentioned the third option is acquire a company. Is that a good choice for a startup? Well, it depends on, um, it really depends on a lot of things. It depends on how, mon how much resources you have, right? Because a startup effectively um, is a company that either wants to build from ground up, right? And they go to investors and then those investors hopefully are strategic and they help them. And think about Shark Tank, right? You want to get one of those uh, sharks who knows the industry you're going into who can give you way more than money. Um, they can give you strategic knowledge and, and, and connections. Uh, but if you're a person who has an option to acquire a company, you have the financial resources to acquire that company and you wanna drive that company to do things with your brand, then that could be a good choice. And so really you have to look at the specifics of the particular um, situation you're in to determine which makes the most sense. And, and if you have no companies currently and you're just going to acquire a company, then you're prepared to just engage with that company, you as an individual. But if you're a multi-billion dollar company and you're thinking about acquiring other companies to, to, out, you know, to fill out your brand um, universe, then you have to think about how good are you at engaging with um, merger and you know, acquiring and merging those companies so that they're successful. So let me go back to the second question. How are you able to actually determine if your brand effectively meets the criteria for being able to expand it actually in actuality, as opposed to just convincing yourself that expansion is possible? Is every brand capable of expansion on the method used? Great question, Jock. Um, the answer to that question is, is, is really a, a, an important one. And I actually came up with, uh, I wrote another book which is um, around the idea, is your brand ready to stretch into new categories? And in that book, which is around 80 pages, I go through all the details of how to determine whether or not your brand is actually comp capable. Um, and things like, you know, that I'll talk about are how, how strong does your brand come uh, when, to mind in consumers' minds? So when they think about a particular category, does your brand come to mind? And if it does, then, then that's one of the criteria. Is, is the brand 
uh, considered by the vast majority of consumers to either have a, a, a loyal relationship, uh, where, you know, where, where, where consumers are buying that as the, as the preferred choice <coughs> or a higher level, which I'll call an insistent relationship where I'm only going to buy that particular brand. The example I'd love to use is Coke versus Pepsi, right? You go into a restaurant and you say, I want a Coca-Cola. And they say, I'm sorry, we don't have Coke. Is Pepsi okay? And if you're insistent, you answer no. Um, and, and, and if you're my wife, Emily, you say, is Monopoly money okay? You know. Um, so the point is you want a brand that's loyal, um, insistent, or even higher, which is I call an advocacy level, right? And so that's another criteria. And, and, and so I would recommend that you, you look at the, um, the book, uh, Is Your Brand Ready to Stretch into New Categories? But the last thing I would say is the best way to know whether a brand is able to be licensed is if you've had a company come to you and say, I want to license your brand. Because there is no substitute for actually hearing from some company who says, your brand um, with my product is something I'm interested in licensing because I believe there's an opportunity here. And once that happens, you have to decide whether or not the category that the license, prospective licensee is in is one that's going to fit with your brand expansion point. What was the name of the book you recommended for me? Um, so there, there are a couple of books, the, and I'm, I'm just going to flip to my, um, to my website because I can just list a few of them so that you can... I can share with you a couple of names of those books. Okay, the first book um, is uh, the book that basically the conversation or the discussion we had today is, is from, which is Expand, Growth, Thrive. The next book that uh, I wrote, which is helpful for people who are looking at um, growth, they're trying to grow their companies. And so this book is called Brand Licensing Versus Traditional Growth Strategies, an executive's guide is deciding what's right for your brand. So that's somebody who's tried traditional growth strategies and maybe hasn't seen all of the success they've wanted. They can look at this as an opportunity to assess whether or not brand licensing will give them uh, additional benefit. Then the book I was just referring to, whether determine whether or not your brand is actually able to um, be licensed, is licensable. I, I call that book, is your brand ready to stretch into new categories? And that will tell you in this book through a proven scoring system whether or not you're ready to be um, to be able to license it, or whether or not you need to do more brand building. And as I say, drive your fans to that loyalty, insistent, and advocacy level. Um, I think not so. The the book I was talking about for you is called Breakthrough Licensing for Licensors. This is a book that takes you through every stage of the process. You know, it tells you whether you know what whether your brand um should should be licensed what categories whether you should you know you know who, where you find your licensees once you've found them how to vet those licensees how to create um win-win deal terms how to put a contract in place how to do a you know a, a very exciting orientation with them so that they hit the ground running and then how do you business plan with them so you drive them to their own ex their own success. There's another version of that same book called Breakthrough Licensing from a manufacturer's perspective. So if you're a prospective licensee, you can use this book to make sure that you are in the same place of strength so that you will be successful with the licensors you choose. Um, one more I'll, I'll just share, it's called Tilt the Deal in Your Favor. And this is a negotiation uh, guidebook. So here I'm trying to get to win-win and so there's a lot of terms in there. Um, when Sometimes we get to win-lose when the terms uh, that you want are too strong for you and not advocating for your partner, your business partner. And I look at licensing as like a marriage, right? It's not transactional. I'm not selling somebody a car or a building and then I never see them again. With licensing, you're entering into a long-term relationship. And so for that reason, um, you have to come up with uh, deal terms that are win-win so that five weeks from now, five months from now, five years from now, both parties look at this relationship and say, I'm so glad um, I got into it because it's been absolutely fabulous for me. 
if anyone wants to speak up now, feel free to. Um, I think we're almost out of time. Savannah, was there any other questions that you saw? Uh, no, there was no other questions I saw, but I just sent in the chat um, a link to the next webinar that we're going to start doing. We're going to do a webinar series, so I sent that link. Um, also, just remind you guys that I'm going to send out an email with the link to the YouTube uh, recording of this and also a survey so you can learn more about your experience today. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. I just want to thank everybody for being on the webinar today. I hopefully, I hope that this information was valuable to you. I'm excited about continuing, especially in today's world with COVID-19, where we can't see each other face to face to continue to share knowledge and help you be successful during this challenging time and set you up for continued success. So I just want to say thank you so much. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone on the call today uh, on, in two weeks' time at the same time. And I just uh, wish you a great rest of your day. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye, Molly. See you guys. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Pete. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Alexander. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful day. You too, Jacques.